Well, when you've been out on a summer road trip on days gone by and the kids are asking, are we there yet? Have you ever looked up from the steering wheel or from the road in front of you, glanced at the mileage or looked beyond the horizon, uh, maybe drove by a sign and thought, something doesn't quite make sense here. And even as you say, not, not much further now to whoever's been incessantly asking the question over and over again. In the back of your mind, you think, I hope I didn't miss the turn off. I, I hope I'm headed in the right direction. I hope I see something familiar soon. I, I hope it's not much further, but, but something isn't quite as you thought it would be by now. Ever have that happen? Well, welcome to week number five of Are We There Yet? This summer road trip through the last book of the Bible, a teaching series designed to help you look at the signs all around us and answer that very question, are we there yet? But a much bigger question than are we almost to the next hidden gem or are we almost ready for another one of Nate's nifty summer drinks? No, are we almost to the end of the road as we know it? Are, are we almost at the end of this world? Over the last couple of weeks in particular, uh, as we looked at the seven churches of Revelation and this message written down by John on the Isle of Patmos from Jesus, not just to those historic churches back in the day, but, but clearly, if you've been doing your homework and traveling with us at all, his message to all believers and to us today. Well, we can't help but notice, if you've been following, that time and time again, there's a reoccurring theme, uh, especially to these seven churches, that you're doing this so well, Jesus kept saying. I'm proud of you. Let me, let me congratulate you. Good job on these things. But then, time and time again, doesn't he point out that even with all this good, there's this other side. There's this one thing or these few things that I need you to take note of, that, that you need to change, that you need to do differently. And when I read uh, both these encouraging words and these corrections, I can't help but to think of Jesus as coach, as mentor, as friend, as teacher, father figure even. A mix of so many relationships, almost like a real person, right? With different facets, like all real and important relationships, complicated at times, comprehensive and completely captivating, a, a real person. And Jesus comes to us with this real advice. You know, when you read through the book of Revelation, you, you can't help but to get conflicting messages about the person of Jesus, messages that don't actually contradict each other, but messages that cause a tension for sure. And if you're not comfortable with Jesus being a real person, a fully developed and authentic individual, uh, and instead need a one-dimensional figure to represent the God you think you already know, well, this can be an uncomfortable book to read and to study. But honestly, being uncomfortable can be very good. As a teenager, when I was teaching swimming lessons on the side of a swimming pool, it was when I got off the deck and, and got all wet and uncomfortable that I was most effective, that I even enjoyed it the most. It was when a student jumped into the deep end of the pool for the very first time that they were most proud of themselves and yet highly uncomfortable. It's when we leave our comfort zone that we grow. And so when I read through the book of Revelation, I like the tension, the fullness, the new perspective I get on Jesus. It's like uh, the fact that he encourages, corrects, coaches, and warns us all at the same time. Well, it just feels more full, more real than the simple glimpses that we get of him from the four perspectives of the four writers of the Gospels and more like the Jesus that is represented throughout the entire Bible, starting in Genesis, and through every other book of the Bible. Yes, Jesus in Genesis. I'll save that one for another sermon. 
But, but Jesus, bottom line, is much more than the few years that are largely captured in the Gospels. Just like my dad was much more than the man I knew as a teenager at this one period of time. I'll, I'll never forget the first time I saw my dad cry because that wasn't a side of him I saw very often. And I'll never forget seeing him angry because that wasn't a side of my dad that I saw very often either. But, but honestly, I think less of my dad if he didn't cry when certain things happened. And I'd be pretty confused if certain things didn't make him angry. I never wanted to see him angry, and I never wanted to make him angry. I never wanted to see him cry. I, I never wanted to make him cry. But because he was real, some real things call for tears, and other real things call for anger. And the same is true for Jesus. As some of you are reading through the pages of this final book of the Bible, you're questioning. You, uh, you should be questioning, at least, uh, the, the judgment, the justice, the, the wrath side of Jesus. We've been taught so much about his love and acceptance, his grace, his mercy, his miracles in the Gospels. And, and those things are all true. They're still there and they're in this section too. But, but sometimes we struggle with the rest of Jesus, the, the tension that emerges with the language that he himself used toward these seven churches and in turn toward believers, toward you and toward me. In chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, uh, the illustrations or word pictures that we read, well, we, we don't like the image of him removing some believers, some churches, some people from positions of influence. And we certainly don't like the idea of punishment, consequences, or results from disobedience. So, sometimes... We rush to the question when we read these words, maybe even mistakenly interpret them as contradictions. And we ask, well, where's the grace? Where's the mercy? Where's the forgiveness now? We can quickly gloss over the earnest praise and appreciation expressed by Jesus for what he could praise the seven churches for. The kindness he was expressing in doing unpopular things of pointing out where, where they and we, honestly, need to change. The, the mercy inside the invitation to, to turn from where they were headed and instead go in the right direction for their good, inviting them to repent. And only after all that all that grace, all that mercy, all that second chance. It's only after all that that he goes on to tell you the consequences. Uh, here's what will happen uh, if you don't do what I'm asking you to do. I mean, that just sounds just, fair, and right to me to be praised, to be corrected, and then to have the consequences clearly laid out for you. If you don't do this, well then, let me tell you, that will happen. That's fair. That's just. That's right. That's what I would expect my dad to do. That's what I would expect our Heavenly Father. That's what I would expect of Jesus. Without telling someone in advance what's going to happen when you know full well how this thing turns out, well, that, that would be just cruel. That could only happen in the absence of grace, mercy, and forgiveness. But Jesus makes it quite clear, not, not just in this last book of the Bible, but throughout his teaching. It's his will that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. That all who turn to him, all those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, the Bible says. And they will spend an eternity with him in heaven, our eternal reward. And that, that's our next stop on this incredible road trip through the book of Revelation. Stick with me here for a few minutes and I'll be back to share with you from Revelation 4 and 5 a little glimpse of what our eternal home will be like. And I want to talk to you about the four living creatures and the seven seals that are about to be revealed. All right, Revelation chapter four begins with great clarity. 
It, it starts with the words, after this. When we read after this, we should simply ask, after what? After the things described in the closing verses of Revelation chapter 3, those seven churches, the last of the living disciples, John, representing all true believers, is told, come up here. And he was immediately, the Bible says, caught away into heaven and he saw the Lord. This This is where we have the second coming, the rapture of all believers, when we too, like John, will be called up here to be with Jesus. In this first, or in the first three chapters, we've seen what was. We've walked through the seven churches and seen what is. And now, now we're about to see what is to come. Now, before I dive into this section, I want to quickly explain that there are many views on the order of how this will all unfold. But after 30 plus years of of study and, and following scripture, I want to explain to you why I believe the rapture will happen before all of the terrible things that you're going to be reading about starting in Revelation chapter 6. And and what are referred to in the book of Revelation as the coming uh, great tribulation. I simply want to explain to you why I don't believe that I will be here for that horrible time and why you don't need to be worried about it either, if you are a believer. We don't have a rule here at the Point Church, by the way, that says, you must believe what I believe as the lead pastor. In fact, if we have a rule, it's just the opposite. You need to decide for yourself what you believe. And my hope is you'll base your beliefs, whatever they might be, on Scripture. But I also want you to know and understand, full disclosure here, that some people much smarter than I am would totally disagree with what I'm about to teach you, what I'm about to explain to you. And yet, you need to remember that some people who have studied this also much more thoroughly than me and who are also much wiser than me, uh, that they would agree with me totally. You can go searching for what makes sense to you and what you want the end of this world to be like, and there's someone out there teaching it. Many of you listening to me know me, and and you trust me in my teachings, research and presentations, and so although you don't need to agree with me on on this, even if you agree with me on lots of other things, I I want you to at least know uh, I've put the same work, prayer, and preparation into what I'm about to explain to you as I have everything else that I've taught you. Here goes. No one knows the day nor the hour of the rapture. That that is when all uh, living believers will be caught up in the air to meet Jesus. But because I believe deeply in the word of God as my final authority, I want to share with you now um, just a few verses that convince me that we will be taken away, uh, caught up in the air, that we, like in John's vision, um, that that we will be uh, called up here and we will not need to suffer through the coming great tribulation. If, in fact, we are still living and if, in fact, you are a believer. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus lays out the plan for the end times. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, the Apostle Paul teaches us about this rapture at the end of this church age. We we can find reference to this event, the return of Christ, his second coming, the rapture, throughout the Old and New Testaments. It's in the Bible, and it's going to happen. It's part of biblical prophecy. And in the same way as more than 2,000 of the 2,500 biblical prophecies have already been fulfilled, and more are being fulfilled this very day, this prophecy as well, the return of Christ, it will be fulfilled. When Revelation chapter 4 says, after this, and then John is called up here, Well, we are seeing in a new light, a fresh perspective, what Jesus had already taught during his earthly ministry in Matthew chapter 24. And what Paul 
was explaining when he wrote in 1 Thessalonians, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. That is, those who have already died. Not just sleeping uh, through my sermon, but, but believers who are actually dead. We, we don't want you to be uninformed about them, he writes, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. You've got hope. He, he's saying you are different than the rest. Uh, As a believer, you have hope. In fact, your hope is a sure thing. It's not just the hope you win the lotto. It's the biblical hope, a sure thing, being confident of what you do not see. Here's the essence of the Christian gospel. Paul goes on and he writes it in verse 14. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So first off, right here, we can know that when Jesus first came as a baby and grew up to be our Savior, he came for you and me. But when he comes again, when the second Uh, coming arrives, it says here that he is bringing a crowd with him. All those believers who have gone before us, who have fallen asleep in him, and they're not sleeping. Paul's just using a bit of a kind euphemism here. When, when, When I'm asked to do a funeral, I don't say, oh my goodness, uh, who kicked the bucket? Who dropped dead? Or who's pushing daisies? No! I say, oh my, who passed away. Who is it that went to be with the Lord? Who is it that is gone home? And when the Apostle Paul says, asleep in death, he wasn't saying that anyone was physically sleeping, but that every believer who went on before us, that they would be coming in the clouds with Jesus. Look at verse 15. According to the Lord's word, he writes, We tell you that that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. You're not going to get to heaven before those who have passed on before you. Why? For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. They're already there. They'll be in the clouds with Jesus. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This isn't something to be afraid of. This is something to encourage you. Here's the hope of every believer. Here's the hope we find in the book of Revelation. We've we've got an eternal home. We've got something to look forward to. We've got nothing to fear, and we've got a mansion just over the hilltop. So sometimes when God comes to you, he comes with a prompting, a whisper, a nudge. Sometimes he comes humbly as a baby. Revelation reveals that the day is coming when he will come with a voice like thunder, like a loud trumpet sound. John writes what he sees, and and he can hardly contain himself as he he pens these words. At once, I, I was caught up in the Spirit, all caught up in worship, he's saying. And, and there before me was a throne in heaven and with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. I, I hear John just grasping for the right words, like, like some who claim to have had near-death experiences who find the the beauty so hard to put into words. They, they say they walk toward the light. The light was so overwhelming, they would tell us. And the colors were beyond what we think of as colors. 
Well, John said, surrounding the throne, 24 other thrones. And seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. He's saying, I wasn't the only one caught up in worship that day. My worship would never have been enough. He goes on, from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. And maybe that's better explained as a sevenfold spirit of God. Also in front of the throne, he writes, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures. And they were covered with eyes in, in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had the face like a man. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is, and who is to come, 24 hours a day. These living creatures worshipped the only one worthy to be worshipped. They were created to worship. I can't read this whole chapter to you. You've you got to read this, and you've got to feel the passion, the overwhelming power in this moment that John was experiencing, caught up in the moment. Listen, if you've ever been bored in a worship service, if you've ever thought, when will this song end? If you've ever said to yourself, why do they keep repeating the same words over and over and over again? If you've ever said, is this almost done? Are we almost through yet? Don't worry. You have no idea. We have no idea what real, authentic, fully engaged worship really is. Not wanting to be crude, but not knowing how else to explain it. Worship is a little bit like uh, thinking your first kiss was so great. But clearly, that's as good as it gets. You would believe when you have that first kiss with that special someone. And at, at some point, a first kiss, it's going to get old. It's going to get boring, and you're going to want more. I promise you. Let, let me tell you. Future kisses get much better. There's much more involved without getting into a whole lot of details. And, and, and what we experience here on this earth, no matter how good or bad it's been, when, when it comes to worship, it's nothing. It's a mere warm-up, a mere rehearsal for what's coming. These Four living creatures that, that were built to worship 24-7. These 24 elders representing the redeemed in Christ that continuously fall down. you, you got to understand, this won't get old. What, what you know and understand isn't all there is. But there is so much more than we can understand or that John could even find words for. What no eye has seen, the Bible says. What no ear has heard. What, what no human mind has conceived. Those are the things God has prepared for those who love him. See, these four living creatures, I see no hint that these are just symbolic, but rather literal beings that are a special exalted order of angelic beings who are going to uh, come up again and again in the chapters that follow, by the way. But, but they are full-time worshipers, taking worship to a higher level than we could understand or imagine. That they lead the rest of us, or they will lead the rest of us, in worship at the front of the throne. It's clear here, in these two chapters I asked you to read, that the seven seals are holding back something that only Christ himself can open. And next week, as you read of the opening of these seals 
And that seventh seal makes way for the seven trumpets. You're going to be introduced to a series of judgments from God. It's about to get real messy. And, and you might wonder again, wait, where's the grace? Where's the mercy? Where's the forgiveness now? Is, is this the same person who we taught our kids to sing about? Jesus loves me? Does Jesus love me? How can he love if these things are going to happen? Oh, oh yes, he loves you. And he loves us more than we could ever possibly imagine. Loves us too much to leave us where we're at. And again, it's not his will that any of us would go through these final judgments or face this justice, this wrath, these consequences. As a child of the Most High God, you don't have to face these things. Uh, But it's his will that we would all come to repentance, that we would all become his children. And in the same way, as I would wonder what kind of a dad I had if he didn't get angry about certain things or shed tears about other things. I'd wonder what kind of weak Jesus we had if he allowed certain things to go on much longer or go on unpunished. But that punishment, that wrath, it's not going to be directed at us or it need not be. Don't miss this. There's a warning here in these verses for each of us, for you and for me. God God has every intention to get you off this earth and into his presence before any of what you are about to read in chapters 6 and beyond ever happens. Jesus saves and he invites us to follow him, to trust him, to let him do the work for our salvation. And it's his intention for us to simply receive his free gift of eternal life. Out of that tribulation, Jesus has no intent on sending anyone into a world of great tribulation or or any more than he has any intention of sending people to hell. The, The Bible's quite clear. Hell was prepared for the devil and his demons, not for people, but people choose to turn their backs on God, professing themselves to be wise, thinking of themselves more highly than they ought, and they follow the enemy into a Christless eternity instead of following Christ, the one who loves them. And it's not going to be God who ever gives up on us, but rather God simply turns us over to what we really want, demand, cry out for, wishing, wanting, hoping, for more time away from him, from his best, from his ways. There was a time when I was in no hurry for the return of Christ. In fact, there was a a time before I was married and still going to university where I actively prayed and asked Jesus not to come back. At least uh, not until I got married and did the wild thing with my wife. Because frankly, I couldn't at that time imagine anything better than doing the wild thing with my soon-to-be wife. And if you're honest, if you'll be transparent, there are certain events that you think, well, I hope to get to this or I hope to try that before I die or before Jesus comes back. We, We call it a bucket list. And most of us have one, at least subconsciously. Most of us would think it was a pure tragedy to see even a believer die too soon and miss out on this or that because, catch this, we're human and in our humanity, we have no concept of how real, how great, or how much better our better place will be. Our eternal home need not be rushed into. Uh, There's a race set out before us. We're here on purpose and we have things to do and a role to play. But we also need not dread or fear. We need not be saddened or feel like we're sacrificing to end up in our heavenly reward and see firsthand what John saw in his vision. The face of Jesus Christ, the throne room, the opportunity to live in the fullness of his presence, to become true worshipers and to experience all that we were truly created for. Can I pray with you? 
Just bow your head right now, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your provisions, for your protection. God, forgive us for so many times trying to do life our way, trying to understand this stuff our way, trying to put our own spins and interpretations on things. But, but this day we just pause and we repent. We turn from where we were headed and we turn toward you afresh and anew. We thank you that you are the God of second chances. That, that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and fair enough to forgive us our sins. And so this day, we start again. We start fresh. We start new. We invite you to move right into the very center of our lives. We receive you as our Savior. We want to serve you as our Lord. God, we know that in and of ourselves we'll never be good enough. You'll have one thing against us. But thank you that you also came to fill the gap. God, we receive your grace. We receive your mercy. We we receive your plan. And we look forward to spending an eternity worshiping you forevermore. It is in Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. Hey, this week, this coming week, I want you to read um, Revelation chapter 6, 7, and 8. Three chapters and hold on to your seats. Things are about to get a little crazy for, for the unbeliever especially. They're going to get scary. But, but remember, you won't be here. Only those who truly reject the grace, the mercy, the love, the forgiveness of God. He's he's doing everything he can. He's got plans working together to get us into heaven safely. He wants to spend eternity with us. He's got something better for you than what you're about to read in these next chapters. But I want you to read these and then be back here again, will you, next week? And I'll share with you. But read Revelation chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8. And this week, the most important thing you can do, more important than reading, is to worship. Spend a little time in the presence of the living God.